In this episode, I interview Ken and get his advice on starting a Dynamics 365 consulting business. This is a Dynamics 365 show focusing on the ingredients of a successful Dynamics 365 practice. Your host is business applications MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as NZ365Guy. If you're looking at starting a Dynamics 365 consulting business or have an established practice and would be keen to have a chat, send me a message on Twitter or LinkedIn by searching for NZ365Guy. To review the show notes for this episode, please go to nz365guy.com forward slash 25. I would like to thank the generous contribution from our sponsor, iNorgic. Maplytics by iNorgic is a market-leading certified for Microsoft Dynamics 365 geoanalytical mapping app. Maplytics empowers users with powerful map visualization and routing capabilities within Dynamics CRM to drive better sales, improve business processes, and engage right customer at the right time. Maplytics now works with Dynamics 365 version 9 and Dynamics 365 app for mobile and tablets. iNorgic is a leading Microsoft Gold Dynamics CRM ISV, delivering best-in-class Dynamics 365 solutions, as well as cost-effective and high-quality programming services. Hi everyone, I'm here with Ken Farmer, and in this episode we're going to be looking at how to start a Dynamics 365 consulting business. As founder himself, Ken is over 17 years consulting, implementing, training, and supporting companies in their CRM and technology initiatives. His passion and specialty is implementing effective solutions for small and medium-sized businesses. Ken's industry and vertical experience includes non-for-profit, hospitality, software, healthcare, service, media, and manufacturing. In addition, he has integrated front and back office solutions in a wide variety of configurations. Hey, Ken, welcome to the show. Mark, thank you. Appreciate the invite. Great. It's good to have you on here. I've met you at so many events over the the past years around the world, and uh, it's good to sit down with you and have a, a chat about how you established your business and your practice over the past years. So to kick off, I'd like to ask you, how did you actually end up in the consulting space with Dynamics? <laughs> Well, it was an interesting journey uh, getting here. I actually started my my work life in restaurants. I, uh, from age of 18 on, I managed restaurants and bars for 20 years and uh, loved it. Absolutely loved it. But got to a point where I knew that, you know, it was becoming a, a younger man's game and it wasn't what I wanted to do the rest of my life. And so I started taking Microsoft classes and, and became an MCSE and, and transitioned over to a found a job starting the infrastructure practice for a Great Plains partner. And so we were a, a big fish in a small pond at that point and, and got to know the, the channel ins and outs and spent a bunch of time in Fargo and was lucky enough when uh, Microsoft was coming out, they're kind of doing their, their pre-road show on, on CRM, their CRM product at the time. Uh, I was in a presentation and I happen to say out loud, I guess, you know, gosh, I, I like that product. We should carry it. The company president was on one side of me and the owner was on the other side and they kind of looked at each other and said, tag, you're it. So, you know, I, uh, I started their CRM practice and, and uh, we participated actually in the, in the beta, beta one program in, uh, in CRM. So it's been, it's been an interesting ride. And, and I just got to the point where, I just fell in love with the product and the flexibility, you know, everything that you can do, the platform itself. And, and uh, while I'm not, you know, a pure technical person, I, I think of myself more as a solution architect, business process guy. It's, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful ride. Wow. It's interesting. You use that phrase there, I fell in love with the product. And over the past uh, weeks as interviewing various people, it's a common thread mm -hmm. of the, the folks that are really, you know, into the technology, if you like, and into, you know, been doing this for years. They, you know, like myself, has just fallen in love with it. Love how, you know, the problems it can solve, the solutions you can build from it. It's fantastic. So can you tell me about getting motivated to start your own business? What led you down that path, breaking away from your, you know, whoever you're working for and doing your own thing? Well, for me, I think it was uh, kind of a, it was purposeful, yet at the same time, it was almost accidental. I had a great relationship with both the owner and president. They were best friends and they had been forever for the company I was working for. And I just saw them going in a different direction than I thought was, was probably best for them, for the company and for the industry. But they made a conscious decision to do it and, and it was their company, you know, so 
I decided at that point that it was it was probably good for me to leave, and and I left on what I think are excellent terms. I still have lunch with those guys, you know, every once in a while, and get together with them when I can. But uh, it was just time for me to go off and and do my own thing, and and I didn't start out thinking, hey, I'm going to leave here and start my own company. It was more of a I'm going to leave here, let them do what they're going to do, and then I'm going to try and you know figure out what I want to be when I grow up, kind of thing. And because I'd been with them for nine years, I want to say. Wow. And, okay. And I, as soon as I left, I mean, I, I put in my notice and you know, gave them a month and I would say, didn't really talk to anybody about it. But th- three days later, I had a partner call me. Hey, uh, I hear you're leaving. You know, do you want to come work for me? And I, and I really didn't. And, <laughs> and, uh, but there, the, you know, the next statement was, well, okay, but can you help me with this? Or can you help me with that? And, and I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. And, and six months later, I turned around and realized that I was doing that for three, four, five different partners at the point. Wow. And uh, was was pretty fully booked and uh, had to think about setting up my, you know, my contracts and my company and, and doing all that at that point. And, and after a couple of years of doing that, I, I finally decided it was time to, to do something formally and created my, my current company and started hiring people. And, and here we are. Wow, so you didn't sit down and write your business plan and vision statement to start with? <laughs> no, 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 I didn't. I, I thought about it and you know, obviously since then I've you know, we've done budgeting and, and yeah. you know, strategizing and everything else. Uh, we, we do quite often, but no, at the time it wasn't. It was just me leaving a one company and falling into a couple of other things and then looking up a couple of years later realizing I had to do something serious. Wow. Incredible, incredible. So how many years ago did you kick off officially this company then after doing that contract? It's been almost eight years. So it was uh, uh, January of 2011. Mm-hmm. And then we, we started out and, and I was hiring staff by April and kind of went on from there. I mean, we're still a little boutique Boutique CRM shop, you know, we focus exclusively on Dynamics, uh, excuse me, let me get this right, Dynamics 365 (laughs) customer engagement, uh, which is today's uh, nomenclature. But, you know, we we focus on all the all the different pieces and parts around it, right? We, we connect up to, we do integrations still, quite a few integrations using Scribe or Kingsway Soft or something like that. And, uh, and, you know, all the pieces that touch it, but I don't know how long the, the little boutique Dynamics 365 shop is, is really going to be viable. So we're, we're making quite a few changes to adjust for this next, next business swing. Mm -hmm. So why do you say that about the viability? Is it because the product is becoming so much larger or is there other factors? I think it's a lot of factors, actually. Uh, You know, I try and spend quite a bit of time watching to see where Microsoft's going to zig and where they're going to zag. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not an analyst with 5,000 people behind me, an industry analyst who can, you know, figure that out. So for us, it's really a matter of, of listening and going to the shows and talking to, you know, smart, tuned in people like yourself, the MVP community to figure out what's going on with the product and, and Microsoft and, and then try to decide whether we want to zig when they zig and zag when they zag. And, but it, it, for us, I, I think it, we've, we've really looked at the market over the last year or so, seeing the growth in the product and the addition of things like portals, field service, uh, project service automation. And, and those products are not as much of an outlier as some people think they are. I think they, they fit into the product really well, and we, we love them, and we're, we're definitely uh, implementing them and supporting them. But when you look at what's going on, I think, with the platform, when you look at what's going on with the ERP products, you know, on what I call the low side being uh, Business Central, NAV, and, and of course, the upper side with, with finance and operations and AX. And, and I really look at what I think Microsoft is trying to do and put together a, a marketing picture, right? There, there's always two pieces of, of Microsoft's puzzle to me. There's the, there's the platform and the technology, and then there's the marketing spin. So trying to put those pieces together, to me, it looks like, you know, we can, we can stay small. We, we're a, you know, small seven-person boutique firm is really how I, I describe it. But for us to truly pivot with the product, to me, there's a lot of different pieces now with, you know, 
our, our Microsoft folks are, are pushing Azure, of course, and Office 365. And, you know, we, don't, we, we know them. We work with them. We don't want to be an Azure partner. We don't want to be an Office 365 partner. But at the same time, we look at things like finance and operations, and we look at, at even Business Central in its current iteration and think those are solid additions to the Dynamics 365 name, moniker. The customer doesn't see the difference between Dynamics 365 Business Central and Dynamics 365 for sales. They see what Microsoft is pushing, which is Dynamics 365. For So for us, we're, we're looking at that and thinking, well, we don't want to be a NAV partner. We don't want to be an AX partner, but we have some really, really strong people and, and friends in the channel that we can partner with. And, and we have spent the last six months formalizing those and, and uh, putting ourselves in a position to be able to handle what I call the new business stack, which is everything from you know Business Central, obviously, all the way up to finance and operations and talent and, and everything in between. Yeah. So that's interesting because you've kind of brought out the feeling that, you know, I'm seeing across the channel and that with Dynamics 365 becoming a single, you know, story from a marketing perspective, there's a lot of folks that even, let's say, consultants that feel like they've got to go out and maybe train on F&O and or Business Central. Do you think that that that's a viable a model at a consultant level for them to actually pick up and, if you like, develop the same level of expertise that they have in what was formerly CRM, Dynamics 365, across now in the financial packages? I don't. I'm a firm believer, in, and we've kind of run our company this way, but I'm a firm believer that you got to stay in, in your sweet spot. You've really got to understand what your strengths are. And and I, having spent time in, in what was the Great Plains channel beforehand and and when Microsoft bought Great Plains, obviously the, the GP channel and and seeing what's going on with Business Central and A and O, to me, that's a completely different animal. And what's going on with with uh, consultative process and knowledge in the old CRM channel and experience is certainly not what is happening in F and O. It's completely different world. It's a completely different set of, of skills, in my opinion. And you're talking with different people, right? You're talking with different people within an organization. So, you know, God bless the folks who think they can do both and, and they're going to give it a shot. But to me, I, I just don't think it's an effective way to go. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I've, I've co-pitched with other partners with me taking the, the you know, Dynamics 365 customer engagement side of things and them taking the finance side of things. And, you know, I showed up for the the demo and there's me representing this part of the equation and there was like <laughs> five of them representing, exactly. you know, AX. And it's kind of like, was it AX for HR? Was it AX for, the, you know, managing the financials or general ledger? Was it AX for the share portfolio that they had running? Or was it inventory? You know, each one had a... a person that was an expert in those own areas. And I find, I know there's a bit of confusion at the moment, people going, do I need a cross skill? And I kind of think of it like this is that, you know, if I had gone to university and become a medical student and trained to do orthopedic surgery, there's a bit of a feeling that now we're asked to turn around and learn to become a neurosurgeon, you know, exactly. totally different discipline, totally different amount of training needed. And if I go and invest all my time in, you know, neurosurgery, I'm going to be lost when it comes you know, back on the orthopedic side, because I'm going to lose touch with what's going on there. So I think, I think it's going to create a much more level of specialty of mm -hmm. at a consultant level, even though companies might have, you know, consultants with those multiple specialties on board. I think you're going to even see, and, and I agree 100%, because, you know, having gone through that, even at the Great Plains level, you know, back in the day, it was the, it was the same kind of situation where you had that guy who was who, who knew manufacturing and, and he was going to be handling that part of the process. And then you've got fixed assets over here and you've got, you know, and, and, and that's just exploded even more. And, and I think, I, I really think that we're almost headed to that level of specialization inside the, you know, I'm going to, we're both going to continue to say it. So I'll just keep saying it, the CRM, you know, yeah. product, right? So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, you've got those folks that are incredibly strong at, at you know sales and customer service process. However, is that the same person that should be doing project service automation? Is that the same person who should be should be running a, a large scale field service implementation? So I, I think we're we're 
really in in the in the beginning of headed heading in that direction. And for us, you know, being a smaller shop, that's okay. You know, we've got some folks that, you know, have just, have really kind of glommed on to a certain specialty and and they love it. I mean, I I had a a, a girl who works for me who I didn't know it when I hired her. She's a data geek. She loves data and Excel and and she's a, you know, an expert in that. And and when Power BI came on, she came to me and, and I'm trying to think, well, shoot, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to carry this? How are we going to market it? How are we going to, you know, <laughs> implement? She came to me and said, hey, I want to do that. I want to learn everything there is to know about it. I want to be our Power BI expert. And it was like, wow, perfect. And to me, that was, I think, the point at which I looked at it and said, you know, it's that kind of step is going to have to happen within the consulting ranks quite a bit more than it ever has, I think, with our product. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be more and more hard to be a generalist yes. uh, in this game. So tell me, when considering uh, you know building a Dynamics three six five consulting business, if there are other people on the you know listening here and thinking about what that would look for for them, what type of advice would you give them around? Listen, you need to get these kind of two or three things right before you actually even get into the game. If and I'm not taking it back from necessary when you started, but like knowing what you know of the market now, what would your recommendations be? Well, I think, first of all, you know, anybody who's thinking of doing it, who currently works perhaps with a consultancy somewhere and, and you know, they're generally people that, that think they're at the, the top of their game and, and they're incredibly valuable to that partner. And they, you know, they wake up one morning and say, shoot, I, I really need to go off and do this on my own. The first thing I would probably recommend to them is go have a cup of coffee or tea, take a deep breath and, and think it through. Not, not necessarily don't do it, but think what that truly means. Because somebody who starts out by themselves, like, like I did, there were a lot of mistakes, of course, that, that I made, you know, along my route. But to me, I think, you know, I started out as, as the product expert. I knew the product inside and out. I felt I had a pretty good reputation in the channel. I felt that I could really impact companies and, and help them, and, and that was great. But taking that next step beyond just being an independent contractor into actually creating a company and doing jumping through the hoops that you have to jump through with Microsoft and, and you know, obviously all of the, the financial regulations and, and IRS rules and wherever, you know, whatever municipality you happen to be in. That's a whole different animal. That's something that is so far away from product product knowledge and 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 expertise that you know there's it's you almost need a partner in that. And and to me, I think that's one of the things that I, I probably would have changed earlier is I would have done it in conjunction with somebody else who had a different skill set than mine, who maybe you know understood the product real well, but also had a good business side. Or one of the things that I I hired somebody to take care of very early with sales and marketing. I love getting in front of prospects. I love talking in a sales cycle and, you know, working with people and getting, you know, their process. And and, and I love that, that whole piece, but the actual day-to-day -day grind of sales, man, I hate that stuff. <laughs> I just do. And, you know, it's, it's funny because I'll implement a sales system, you know, sales automation system for somebody, but actually doing that myself is, is just, onerous. I can't, I can't deal. So having that partner, I think having somebody who, who has a complementary set of skills to yours that you can work with and that you know, and, and, you know, you guys can sit and arm wrestle and really kind of determine where your, where your company needs to go, I think is probably one of the keys going out and doing it yourself and trying to build a company by yourself in this industry, I think is, is, I think you're probably deluding yourself if you think you can do it by yourself. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. So then how did you go about filling, if you like, your gaps, uh, you know, where you wanted to broaden outside your skill sets? How did you go about finding those people? Well, I I started first just looking for folks that, you know, in the channel that I wanted to work with and, and uh, maybe bring them on. And, and I found very quickly that as much as I loved those people, at the very beginning, I couldn't afford them. You know, the the early precursors to the MVP community and and the folks that I knew. And for me, networking was key. It, it always has been and, and getting to know a lot of people in the channel. And, and so I started looking at what I wanted and, and I, and I kind of related it back to when I was in the restaurant business where in a restaurant business, you've got specialists, you've got the cooks or the chefs in the back of the house that were 
and, and I'm going to put this as delicately as I can, they were full of themselves and they had the the tendency to look at you on a busy Friday night when the place was going crazy and going, hey, I need a raise and I need it right now or I'm going to walk out the door, right? So in back then, I, I started taking the, the position that I needed to, A, not hire the superstars. I needed to hire people with some of the basic skills that I felt I could mentor and I could bring up and so that there was a lot more loyalty than there was arrogance. And so I, I kind of started that with looking for some people locally, first of all, that I felt had good customer service experience, that I felt had really good problem-solving skills, that may understand a little bit about the finance end of their business, but more importantly, they could take a customer situation and turn it around. And they had maybe a little technical background. So maybe they were helping to manage their their networks back in the day. Maybe they were helping with, you know, some of the office suite and, you know, they're one of those power users. And then, and, and I found somebody like that actually fairly quickly for on, uh, I, I placed an ad in, you know, a couple of the job boards and, you know, I went through crazy interviews and ended up finding a lady, a gal who worked, who lived locally had a customer service experience and I found her through Craigslist. She answered a Craigslist ad and she was my number one employee. Uh, she's still with me and she's a rock star. And, you know, I brought her in and she said, well, I can, I can spell CRM, but I thought I, you know, I, I'm starting to look for a job and another job. And I, and I thought this would be good experience. So we went to lunch and, and chatted and, and I just got to a point where I'm like, you know what? I can teach her CRM. The ins and outs of how to configure a, a sales process and how to do this and how to do that. She has the ability to learn, but she had those those soft skills that I didn't think were really short term teachable. And that's the you know the customer service skill, the, the ability to listen to the, the customer and 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 pull from a conversation what they really needed, not what they were saying necessarily, but the, what they were really needed. And and those soft skills to me were the most important thing. And I've tried to keep that philosophy as I've hired more and more people. My sales guy was, you know, a long-term sales person. He'd, he'd actually been a friend of mine for years and years. And and we implemented CRM for him and his his company early on. And when I went on my own and, and he kind of felt one of those things, he fell in love with CRM. He'd never sold it before, but, you know, he was the one that I finally pulled in and said, look, you know, we need to, you need to come in as, as a partner and, and take, you know, percentage of the company and, and just take over sales and marketing for me. And, and, you know, what I like to say brought adult supervision to my sales and marketing <laughs> group. Uh, so uh, he did. And, and that kind of, I think started us off on a, on a good path. And, and, uh, and I've been fortunate to find good people. And in some cases, my, my technical guy was one who had actually been in the channel working with CRM for, and, was really good at problem solving. He, he's one of those technical guys that I can have talk to a customer and I, and I won't be embarrassed. Uh, he's, he's good in front of people and, and careful with what he says and super smart, uh, you know, on the technical side too. But uh, everybody else I hired really didn't know much about the industry, but they had the, the soft skills and I've been able to, to mentor them and work with them. And, and now they just, they surpass me in a lot of different areas. Excellent. Do you find it's easier the further you go along, the further you've you know developed a business over the last eight years that you now have, if you like, runs on the board yourself. So when you you come to employing people, are they being attracted to your business? Are they feel you're a safe bet to work for? Has it kind of changed over the years how you would employ, if you like, if you needed to add another one next month? Do you think that process is quite different or evolved for you? Absolutely. I think the early hires, you know, Jess and and Sanford and Aaron, you know, I, I thanked them when they came on board for taking that leap of faith, right? You know, you got this guy who's kind of trying to build a business and, and you're jumping on board with both feet and you're, you're making a commitment. And, and to me, that was a, a huge leap of faith. And, and I thank them for it every, almost every time I see them. But now you're, you, you are correct. It is different. There is a track record. We've been around for, as a corporate entity, almost eight years and I think there's a, a not, if they're in the channel already, they do know of us. They've heard of us. They can easily research us if they don't know that much. They can ask folks. 
So it is a, a little bit different process. Um, I would say that I still don't necessarily look for that rock star. I mean, I would love to have a Mark Smith in my organization, but I also know that I can't afford Mark Smith, right? So it, it's one of those things where we we look for people that we can grow into those rock stars, and then hopefully the loyalty is there and, and they're not going to get poached and go somewhere else. Yeah, so true. So true. Have you had any staff go and start their own thing? It doesn't no. start their own practice. No, no, not it's at good. all. It's good. I did hire a, a, a gal for some technical work a year or so ago and, and uh, it didn't work out. And then she decided that she was going to go and do her own thing. And, and that failed miserably, but, but we've kept in touch and, you know, she's now working for a customer, actually, uh, not, not a customer of mine, but for a user. And, and doing pretty well, you know, she's doing well, but, but I've been fortunate that the folks that, that I've hired, I still have my core group. I still have my original group and, uh, and they, they make me joyful every day. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So how do you go about promoting your consultancy? You, you know, you've said it's a boutique. I know exactly what you mean. I've had, had one myself and promotion, you know, you don't have the dollars that the big companies have, et cetera, for marketing packages, et cetera. So how do you go about promoting and getting, if you like, that engagement with potentially new customers? Well, that's the $64 question, isn't it? <laughs> that's, the, that's the big piece of secret sauce that nobody can quite figure out, I don't think, in our industry. You know, and I, and I look at those folks that are, at least on the surface, they seem to be successful at doing that. And, you know, I kind of watch what they're doing. And, and for them, it's, it's almost a shotgun approach. And I spend a lot of time trying to analyze what other companies in, the, in, the, in our industry are doing and, and how they get customers and, and what's working for them and what doesn't work for them. I mean, we've gone through two or three different ad agencies. We've gone through marketing groups. We've even tried to hire somebody and bring somebody in-house ourselves. And all of it's just sort of had a... a modicum of success. It's been, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there. And and today we look at it as really trying to identify who our customer is. And, and we'll go through and, and say, we want to, for instance, we just released a medical device manufacturing solution. And so we're targeting a very small group of companies really in our, in the Southwest in you know Southern California, California, Nevada, and Arizona that that are in this industry, and, and we you know it's one of those things where we all of a sudden looked up and realized we had five of these kinds of clients, and while they each thought they were unique, we did the almost the exact same thing. You know, ninety percent of what we did for each one of them was the same. So we built a solution around it. So what we're trying to do is is then look at that from a marketing standpoint. What does that look like? And we're we're doing a, a trade show coming up here in the fall with them, and we're we're doing email blasts, of course, because uh, you almost have to. Uh, we do the social media stuff because you almost have to. But, you know, it, it comes down, I think, to good old-fashioned shaking hands, looking somebody in the eye, uh, the relationships that you build. Referrals are huge, I think. And, and so we've really kind of been most successful there. We have seen an uptake, uptake in, in leads coming from some of our downloadable content as well as some of the videos that we do. So we do a, a we actually are doing a, a series of tips and tricks, you know, cop, we call it coffee with the pros where it's 10 to 15 minutes of, of just, you know, Hey, here's a, here's a interesting issue. Here's we're going to walk you through it or here's how to do something. And, and it's just really quick, very consumable, but I don't think there's one magic solution other than it's about relationships. You know, we can buy a list and, and try and market to it, but you know, by the time you get the list, 75% of it is garbage, right? And and the other 25% are maybe not even decision makers. So we struggle with that like everybody else. We find that the bigger companies are just shotgunning it. They do everything and whatever sticks on the wall and, you know, they, they can prove that they're, you know, 5% of spend or, you know, 8% of spend or whatever it is they're spending on marketing is, is uh, you know, some number that they can show to Microsoft that's been somewhat effective. But it's a tough one. And, you know, for us, it really starts boiling down to relationships. We have uh, recently, well, I shouldn't say recently because I, I started the company based on our relationships with partners. And 
and becoming the CRM practice for many ERP partners. And and uh, we've continued with that. We do less of it now than we used to do. It used to be 75% of our business, and now it's closer to, to 30 35%. But what I've tried to do in the last year or so is identify critical partners, ERP partners. We've tried it with MSPs, and it, it's not very effective. But we, we've worked with NAV partners. We found, I found a couple of really, really good NAV partners that we like working with. And we're trying to set up go-to-market campaigns with them around the Business Central and Dynamic 365 for sale story. And then I've identified one key AX partner who is, you know, jumping into the cloud and, and going full bore into that, that we're working with and, and doing some co-marketing and, and going to market with, with same kind of story, right? From a, from an FNO standpoint, you know, for sales and customer service and field service. I mean, that's where, where we really push with them. So Lately, we've had some really solid success there. And and for us as a company, I think that checks a lot of boxes in terms of you know, what I see in, in terms of what the market's doing and, and you know, the boutique shop and the things that a boutique shop like ours has to do to adjust and adapt. I, you know, when, when I don't want an FNO practice, but we've got these awesome partners here in, in San Diego that we work with and, and we've done projects together with and, and you know, we can go to market together. Mm, mm. Oh, so good, so good. So, what do you what do you consider your biggest barrier in your business? Do you have one? Is there something that you'd like a silver bullet for? What do you find? Yeah, I, I think it it really comes down to that that marketing effort, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so we I think we do an excellent job when we get an actionable lead. I think we do an excellent job of wrestling it to the ground, you know, building the relationship and seeing, you know, what kind of budget they may have and, and identifying the need and, and presenting them with a, with an ROI level solution. And, and I think we do an, an excellent job there, but the challenge of course is filling that pipeline, right? So, so trying to continually successfully keep the pipeline full is I would think our number one challenge. From an implementation standpoint, I mean, nobody's perfect, but I think we do an outstanding job of customer success, driving our implementations, not just through the initial project, but one of the things I've, I've mentored my team on from day one is identify what project next is and start the conversation about project next yesterday. And, and start making sure that that's on their roadmap. And, and we do a lot of roadmap conversations. I would say we're extremely successful at keeping existing customers and, and doing a lot of projects with existing customers. And we have a, you know, a fixed bid support program. And we've got that really is, is I don't want to say it's a lost leader, but it's there to improve touch points more than be a profit center. You know, there's a lot of proactive things we do under that program. And, and so it's, it's really comes down to building those customer relationships and, you know, picking up the phone and calling them, Hey, I haven't talked to you in a month or two, you know, what's going on. Let's get together. Let's have lunch. Let's, you know, do whatever. So I think we, we handle that really well. And, and I think we're going to continue to, to put an emphasis on that, but, but getting that net new, what, you know, ERP partners love to call greenfield, you know, customers in here is, like I said, once we get the actionable lead, we're, we're awesome. But getting that actionable lead and, and doing the things that we need to do, you know, we're always talking with marketing companies. We're always talking with, you know, we have a, we have a wonderful company that we're working with here in San Diego, but they don't know the industry. Uh, but they, you know, they do our website and they do some things for us from a marketing standpoint, but, you know, they're not industry focused. We've tried some of the industry-focused marketing groups out there, and and unfortunately, their industry, quote-unquote, is either MSP, Azure and Office, or it's ERP. And uh, so we've had limited success with those guys. But that would, that's, our, that's our biggest challenge. And, and we spend a lot of time when, when we sit and we do our annual big, huge strategy meeting, that we spend a lot of time talking about that and, and what are we going to try this year. And, you know, I keep telling us, we're telling Mark, I don't almost don't care what the budget is if it's successful. I mean, if we're seeing actionable results, hell, let's triple the cost. Let's, you know, let's do what we've got to do. But sometimes it, it is a matter of, well, you know, let's try it. Let's, let's put a budget to it. Let's try it, see if it works. And, you know, here's what, here's the results that we're looking for. 
we don't set them too high. We just want to see some good, actionable results. And, and if we get those, then let's continue with it. Yeah. You mentioned there about, and you know, following up, calling with your customers, that type of thing. Does that some is that something that you actually have a plan or a process, like a you know we hear this term customer success manager? Do you? And I'm talking about your existing customers. Do you have a model of, if you like, loving on them on an ongoing basis so they stay with you forever? We do. I, I wouldn't say it's a formal process. We're not really big enough to focus on that customer success manager person, but I think those skills in our consulting group are hugely important. The consultants, I think, have to be sellers and they have to be best friends. They have to be counselors. They have to understand the roadmap. And so once a quarter, I sit down with all of my consultants and we go through our list of customers, old customers, new customers, projects on the board. And the only purpose of that conversation is how's that customer doing? What's our business success health number uh, around that customer? Are they happy? Are they ready to have it? Are, you know, what's coming up next roadmap conversation? Let's take a look at the new features and functionality that have come out in the platform that they could perhaps uh, take advantage of that they're not. And so we do spend a lot of time internally on that. And, and from that conversation, Depending upon the, the level of effort required, sometimes the consultants have a call down list and it's not, it's not onerous. It's not huge. It, it's, it's just something that's part of their job that they have to just pick up the phone and say, Hey, haven't talked to you in a couple of months. What's going on? Last time we spoke, you know, we talked about X, Y, and Z. Have you, have you gotten to that point yet? And, and then we circle back around and, and decide, do we need a formal roadmap presentation? You know, how do we, how do we do that moving forward? But I would say that we, we have a culture of customer success and nurturing those people. We've identified that we, you know, all of our metrics show consistently year after year that we churn one customer a year for whatever the reason may be. And it's always weird reasons, right? But I'm very proud of that, that number and, and the fact that we can hang on to the folks that we do and, and continue to work with them, not just, you know, have them on the books and say, hey, they're a customer. But we actually do spend time and, and we work with a lot of these customers day in and day out. Yeah, very good. How do you handle, if you like, adaptability in the industry? So, you know, I was just at a, a Microsoft event the other day here in London, and there are a bunch of people in the room, you know, bemoaning the fact that there's no news, if you like, on the on-premise, you know, tooling. And for me, you know, I've seen the writing on the wall, I feel, mm -hmm. for years. And if I was in this game and had a dynamics practice today, I would be making sure that I was, you know, developing a team of gurus in the cloud because, you know, it's pretty obvious that mm -hmm. uh, the on-prem world is, is, is definitely not growing, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say it's going away, but it's not growing and you're not going to get too many greed field opportunities. What are your thoughts there? Well, that's actually one of my hot buttons, Mark. <laughs> I believe strongly in the cloud, and I have believed for a long time that the cloud is the only way to go. Today, we not only lead with the cloud, but we try and dissuade any new customers from going on-prem, and, and not just by having a couple of conversations, but we aggressively try and dissuade them from going on-prem. And, and we're, we're in the middle of, what, three projects right now moving on-prem to cloud. So our, our leg, what we call legacy customers, uh, and, and it's funny thinking that you know, an on-prem customer on version 2016 is considered legacy, but that's exactly what, how, we, how we envision it. They need to get out of their own data centers, which generally are not their own anymore. They're you know, hosted somewhere, rack space somewhere, or whatever the case may be. But we believe very strongly in the cloud is, is the only way to go. And, and to be completely honest, when I talked earlier about when I left the GP partner, that was one of the things. So this was 11, 10 years ago. You know, they were trying to make a decision. Do we, do we stay with GP? Do we go with AX? Uh, and I and I felt very strongly that they needed to take on AX, and and I also felt very strongly that they needed to get more resources geared up for the cloud. So even back then, it was something that I felt was, you know, and 
like you said, we've, we've seen those of us who've been in the channel for a while and you're actually listening and paying attention. The writing's been on the wall for a very, very long time. And so we, we, we drive with that. We lead with that. We, we live in the cloud ourselves. So for those folks that, that, as you mentioned in in your your meeting in London there that are bemoaning the fact that you know shoot what are we going to do and we're not getting the you know the releases you know to on prem like we think we should you know I, I can commiserate with them to a certain degree but at some point unfortunately my my tact goes away and I'm like dude get with the program you know I I, I understand I, I I get what you're saying but your future is not with that on prem customer. Your your future is if you're if you work for a customer and you're a user, your job is to get your bosses convinced to move to the cloud. Period. And that's that's the way it's going. So for us, we 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 believe that strongly. And you know the I, I think it's it's funny to have those conversations with folks and and you see that you know you still have those companies that the IT department almost looks at at, at that as their shrinking fiefdom, right? You know, if, if we've got we've got servers, we've got even though they're virtual now, we've got servers, we've got you know cages in data centers, we've got you know all of this stuff, and and it's it's shrinking. And by God, I'm not going to let it go. And you know, we walked into I want to say this was probably nine months ago. We walked into a prospect, and and they had and they weren't an enormous company. They were a, probably a thirty to fifty million dollar company. And they had an IT department of 10 people and they had everything was on prem and they still had, I think it was six year back version of exchange that they were trying to run. And, and, and our first conversation in the meeting was, well, what are your plans for moving to the cloud? What are your plans for moving your your email infrastructure, your exchange infrastructure to the cloud? What are your you know they were a they were a a, a GP part or a GP customer, you know what are your what are your plans there? And and the IT guy that was in the meeting, there were a couple of line of business people in the meeting, but the IT guy, the, the director of IT, was like, well, you know, we we don't think that that's uh, for us a, a viable move. <laughs> and mm. I looked and and my sales guy, you know, Mark, my VP of sales, he just sort of hung his head a little bit because he knew I was about ready to get on my soapbox and this was a, <laughs> this was a dead deal. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. you know, and, and it was, and I, and I try and be tactful in that situation, but when you've got, for us, we look at that, is, would there be a lot of business there for us? Yes, perhaps, but all of our on-premise customers, we struggle with their IT infrastructure. And, you know, they're like, well, we want to, we want to, you know, our, our people in the field should be able to use the mobile apps and they should be able to, you know, get to CRM. Well, here's, here's the IFD, the internet facing deployment <laughs> situation. And well, can you set that up for us? And, and we have taken a position. The answer to that is no, we will help you, but we refuse to mess around with your active directory. We refuse to mess around with your firewalls. We don't want that liability, and that responsibility, but we'll help you. We'll, we'll give you the directions from Microsoft and we'll walk you through them. We'll, we'll get on a section with you, but this is your responsibility. Yeah. Sorry, I, I got off on my soapbox again. On no, that that's good. I like it. I <laughs> you like hit it. one of my hot buttons, Mark. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so apart from the technology, what part does Microsoft play in the success of your business? Not as much as I would like. You know, from the very beginning, you know, I, I started in, as I mentioned, in the Great Plains channel and, and they had an incredible support system for their partners. And even when Microsoft bought them, that continued for a little while. And, and I think we've, I've seen, in my opinion, it drop year over year over year. We have a Microsoft, we are a managed partner. So we have a partner development manager, whatever their current, current title is. And, you know, honestly, he's awesome, but he's not a dynamics guy. He's he's got some some MSPs that you know are selling the crap out of Azure, and you know office licenses, and and he's being wildly successful with those guys, and and he really wants to help us, but you know his compensation, and and he looks at the calculation and sees that his time is most effective monetarily working with those MSPs, and I, you know I don't fault him with that at all. We, we're getting more attention from Microsoft now than we ever have. And there's some folks in the channel that, you know, really, truly do try and include us and, and map us into things. And, and you know, God bless them. And, and like I said, we're getting more 
attention from them today than we ever have. However, the effectiveness of that sometimes is is to be, let's just say, to be determined. You know, they're because we're on the small end of the partner scale, we're not the larger, you know, Hitachis and Avanades and and those guys that have two or three Microsoft people assigned to them permanently, right? We don't have a dedicated person internally to that Microsoft relationship, you know, in, in the in partners that are, you know, twice, even twice our size, they have one person who's dedicated pretty much full time to the Microsoft relationship. And they need that. And I think that's what helps them maybe get to that next level. But, you know, at, at our size, we, we can't just take one person and say, you know, go forth and, and get us more from Microsoft. Anybody at this at this stage of the game, starting out a, a Microsoft partnership who thinks that they're going to be able to live and, and succeed off of what Microsoft gives you, I think is, is, uh, is delusional. Now, and I'm not trying to bag on Microsoft here. I think, you know, they do some unbelievably incredible things. And, and even though I've been in the channel, I'm not a, I'm not a Microsoft Kool-Aid kind of guy. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know me well enough. I, I'm going to call them on their stuff as, as, much as anybody, but I truly believe in, in a lot of the product folks and I, and I believe in the channel and I believe in, in partnering. And those things to me are, are almost more important than what Microsoft thinks they're delivering to me as a partner. It's a challenge sometimes for me to all of a sudden look up and realize, hey, I, I was supposed to do something with Microsoft last month and they never reminded me. And now I got to go figure out what that is. And, you know, it's it's just busy work and and that kind of thing. But uh, I would say that they 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 think that they're helping quite a bit, but the, the smaller partner is neglected, and that's not not new. It's not news, but it is something that that has been I think almost systematic for quite some time. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's uh, I think you're on par there. So before we get into some quick fire questions, Ken, is there anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. I mean, you know, one of the things that that we look to as a as a small partner or, or as somebody who's been in the channel for quite some time, and and this is just you know my personal opinion is you know the job that you guys do uh, in the MVP community is is phenomenal. We look to you guys quite a bit, and we don't sit on every Microsoft panel or board or or you know NDA program that they've got, but we look to you guys to. To help communicate that information to us, and and we we seriously get more actionable information from the MVP community than we do from Microsoft in most cases, and and I just want to take the time to thank you and and all of our other friends in the in the community that that work tirelessly for that, and you know I think it's a huge part of of what we use and and what we leverage to try and be successful. Excellent, thank you, Ken. On behalf of the uh, of the MVPs, I'm uh, I'm sure pleased uh, to hear that from you. So, to look at some quick fires. So, what books, blogs, and podcasts do you recommend most to people uh, that work in Dynamics, and why? Wow, you know, the, it's it's tough keeping up because the information is so broad. The PFE, the Field Group, I try and follow their blog as much as I can, but they don't communicate as much as I would like. A lot of the MVPs, their blogs, I think are rock solid. And and honestly, I don't necessarily subscribe or, or use, use an RSS feed or anything else like that. But but I will get on social media and I'll see different things that are that are listed. And, and that's usually how I pick up based on the folks that I follow and how and social media drives a lot of that for me. And then I communicate that to my staff and we have, we use Microsoft teams and we have a special channel that's just for, you know, Hey, good blog posts we've seen lately. And we, we post them in there for the team so that, you know, it's, it's a little bit more organized than just, Hey, everybody go out on social media and try and find, you know, what's going on. So I, I would say that the podcasts, I, I truly enjoy your podcast, I enjoy Gus's, you know, Joel sometimes, you know, he's sometimes a little bit more technical. But for me, a podcast is tough because I don't commute. I don't have a big hairy commute where I'm, you know, on a train or, you know, in the car for an hour. So for me to take time out of my day to just sit and listen to an hour long podcast is a challenge. When I do it, I love it. But, you know, maybe it's, you know, I've, I've tried recently doing it while I'm out walking the dogs or, or something like that, that, that helps quite a bit. But then I find that I want to take notes. And if I'm out walking the dog, then, you know, <laughs> I, I can't take the notes. And, you know, Mr. Memory is not my friend. 
But I would say that that those, for the most part, are are what I try to do. Books that I'm reading, I mean, I, I focus on, you know, I used to read all of the the CRM books that used to come out, and and you know, the CRM Bible and this and that. But today, it's you know, the, the product changes so fast that I don't know how people can even think about writing a book on certain version. Uh, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> exactly. But uh, the books, mostly the books I'm reading and, and, and try to read are, are business books. So, I so just picked what, up what a business book? Well, I just picked up one that I read quite a while ago from Jim Collins called Good to Great and talking about how to get your company, no matter the size, but get your company to that next level, right? To And one of the analogies that he uses often that I've, that I've used ever since I read the book, what, 10, 12, 15 years ago was, you know, get the right people on the bus and get the right people off the bus, you know, and, and make that decision as early as you can. You know, we have a, we have a policy here that, you know, obviously like most companies, you know, you're on a 90 day probationary period when you start. And luckily I've only had to do it twice, but in this company, at least where you just realize within the first month, yeah, this person's not going to work out. So cut the cord now, deal with the fallout and move on. And and just you know make the decision if you know it's not technical it's it's the right personality and culture fit then make the change. Yeah, so good, so good. What's your favorite app and why? Oh Lord, I'm a geek. I love gadgets. <laughs> I I my philosophy is I need to be able to run my business from my phone. So you know obviously all the Microsoft apps I use quite a bit. Uh, I'm loving I'm loving the Teams app. We've been using it now since it came out. I like it better now than I did a year ago, mm-hmm. but yeah, I uh, and, I, and I like some of the new things that, that are coming out. We just started, actually, uh, you helped this conversation uh, when I saw you last and, and a couple of the other MVPs around VSTS. So, you know, we're, we're working with that and the connections between VSTS and Teams. We're really starting to explore that. I use Twitter a lot. I, I'm on Twitter it's sort of the angry world of Twitter uh, is what I <laughs> what I kind of look at it now. But there's a lot of information. If you can sift through the the garbage and the, and the yelling and the screaming, there's there's quite a bit of information <laughs> for our for our industry. I think there's an incredible amount of information, and and everybody always talks about you know we talked about marketing and, and sorry I'm going to get off on a little tangent here, but you know everybody says well you have to be you have to have a presence. Every marketing company, yay! What what's your Twitter presence and what do you do here? What do you do there? My feeling in, in our industry, Twitter is there for the insiders. Twitter is there for the partners, for the MVPs, for the people in the community. And as long as you look at it that way and use it that way, I think it's a very effective medium. But if you're trying to base your marketing program in our industry around Twitter, I think you're you're so you you're just you're gonna fail, right? You're dreaming. Yep. And then lately just to throw in uh, LinkedIn, uh, we've been LinkedIn fans for a long time and and we were actually a little concerned about the Microsoft purchase and what that was going to do, but it's worked out well. Yeah, it's it's worked out very well, and and we're we're really pleased with with what we are reading is coming out. Nice, nice. What's the best purchase you've uh, made under a hundred dollars? Ooh, under a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Under a hundred dollars. Have I purchased a gadget under a hundred dollars? <laughs> it's not really possible these days, is it? I would say probably is I've got a couple of these Bluetooth speakers mm-hmm. that I use religiously, whether I'm using it with my, my laptop or with Alexa or, or whatever. And they, I've been pleasantly surprised that for 40 bucks, you get this unbelievable little portable unit that's got totally incredible sound. I, I just, I'm blown away at that. And then sometimes the, the battery chargers that I buy, you know, the little backup battery things that I just stick in my bag and... You know, I use those constantly. Nice, nice, nice. I would say all, all of my gadget purchases that I fall in love with are, are more than 100 bucks, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Ken, who do you recommend as a guest for the podcast in future? Wow. You know, I, I was listening to your podcast, by the way, with Krista, which was awesome. Uh, she was she was phenomenal. And, and you asked her that question. And, and I thought, God, I hope he doesn't ask me that because I don't <laughs> – I can't think of anybody – Obviously, the MVP community, you talk to those guys a lot. You, you have them on. I would almost suggest, you know, maybe an ERP partner and talking to them about their thought process behind what are you going to do? You know, if you're a GP partner, what is your plan to get to the cloud? What is your, you know, what do you think Microsoft is going to be able to do for you moving forward? You know, I know a lot of GP partners that have given up. 
that are taking on other products. Maybe they, they've even taken on NetSuite, something like that, that, that is in the cloud. But you know, they, they've gotten to a point where they gave up on Microsoft and, and they still do an incredible amount of you know, GP existing business and, and you know, their renewals, but you know, they're not doing a lot of new sales. So I, I, I would almost think you, know, you start talking to some of these other people in the channel besides our industry, you know, they've had some of the same experiences and, and some of the same challenges building a practice, but almost from a different perspective. Sorry, that was a, a lame answer, but that's kind of no, the best I good. come up that's with. good. <laughs> Ken, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Before you go, if people want to follow you online, where can they find you? Well, our, our company website, Dyn365Pros.com, is a good place. That's where we put all of our blogs. I don't, I don't do my blogs separately. We kind of lump them all up there together as a company. I'm on Twitter, KFarmer4444 is my personal Twitter, which is you know full of things, not just CRM, but CRM as well. And then our company Twitter, uh, Dyn365Pros, is, is active there too. And then, of course, LinkedIn. You've been listening to the Dynamax 365 show. Please consider subscribing to our feed on any great podcast player. Your host was Business Applications MVP Mark Smith, otherwise known as NZ365 Guy. For show notes or to discuss anything covered on this show, please go to nz365guy.com forward slash 25. See you soon.